Even though we just got done watching a video on relationships, the message today has absolutely nothing to do with relationships, all right? But it does have everything to do with how easy it is for life to get out of rhythm. Did you see those butterflies on there that were going too fast and spinning out of control? Anybody ever feel like that in life sometimes? Just the rhythm of it just gets insane and crazy. The message also is about how more often than not, we are just like that elephant and we are trying to find the perfect balance in life all alone, all by ourselves. And I think the time of year that we are in really does sum this up perfectly as well. We are in the space between, yes, we are officially in the Christmas season, but Thanksgiving has just ended and Christmas is still four weeks away from tomorrow. Now, how many of you absolutely love the Christmas season? I mean, how many of you, okay. I mean, how many of you want to get the most that you possibly can? You love the parties. You love the food. You love the cookies. You like the eggnog. You love the traditions, all of that stuff. And you absolutely want to enjoy every single minute of it that you possibly can. Where are you at this morning? I'm here. Okay. But how many of you, just thinking about all of those things that I just said, the next three to four weeks, have you absolutely stressed out already in your mind? Okay, good. I got a, a big hand right up here. Yes. How many of you men are stressed out about how much money is going to get spent over the next few weeks and months? Here, yeah, <laughs> some people raising their hands. The point is, we have a delicate balancing act that has to take place over the next few weeks because there is a lot of busyness and there is a lot of hecticness, but that absolutely should not rob us of the joy that God wants us to experience every single day of our lives, in the midst of our lives. Being more than a conqueror means that you know how to walk that tightrope between everything that is good and right about life and at the same time everything that is wrong and bad about life. There is a balancing act. There is this middle ground that we need to learn and we cannot do it alone. We need to do it with the help of the Holy Spirit and I'm so thankful for God's word because Romans chapter 6 and 7 has given us some incredible answers and that leads me to the title of our message this morning which is this. Know who you are part 3. We're in it again. We have been in the same title of the message for three weeks now, because in Romans 6 and 7, Paul basically is given the same argument. And what he wants us to do more than anything is he wants us to think deeply about who we are in Christ so that we will become who we are in Christ. And that's what Romans 6 and 7 does. In chapter 6, man, Paul was talking to us about the fact that we are united with Christ in his death we died. In his resurrection, we rose again. We are united. We are one with Christ because of his grace. And you know what? The grace of God doesn't mean that he set us free from sin so that we can go back and live however we want. No, we should walk in newness of life. There's a new way God wants us to live. And it's not to take advantage of his grace by living in sin and doing whatever we want. So chapter 6 talks about the imbalance of our sinful heart that, that wants to do what we want and still taste and experience the goodness of God and his grace and the relationship. Well, in chapter 7, you know what he's going to do? He's going to turn the argument completely around. He's going to turn it to the other side of the coin. And he's going to be talking about the danger of legalism. Does anybody here know what legalism is? Legalism, just to sum it up, is trying to produce your own righteousness by obeying the law. Remember, we were just talking about balance, right? The tightrope between everything that is good and right and everything that is evil and wrong. How many of you agree there is a fine line between living a life that is pleasing to God and still trying to balance that out with our sinful, rotten flesh, and we can go from one extreme to the other. We can, we can give up and we can say, it's impossible, so I'm just going to live how I want and ask for forgiveness. Or we can try so hard to be what God wants us to be that we go to the other extreme and we're not experiencing any freedom and any joy in our relationship with God. God doesn't want either of that for us. We are people of extremes, and we've got to find that right balance in life. And we've got to find the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why 
we are in this message. That's why Paul, that's why God ultimately wants us to know who we are in Christ. So that way we will become who we are. So let's just jump right into it. All right, let's start with the setup. All right, the setup in verses 1 through 6. Everybody look at verse 1 with me of Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 verse 1, it says this. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So Paul is talking to people who do know and who do understand the law. And he says, no, you're not. Don't you know? And the answer is, yes, they do know. And here's what he's saying. Don't you know that the law is for life? The only thing that will release you from your obligation to be obedient to the law is death. As long as you are alive and breathing, you've got to obey the laws of the land and you've got to do what's right. The only thing that will release you from it is death. So he's setting something up. Now in verses two through four, he illustrates this with marriage. All right, and marriage is an incredible illustration to, to point this out. For those that do know the law, you will know that God's design and his intention for marriage has always been one man with one woman for one lifetime. What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. That's what marriage is all about. One man, one woman, one lifetime. It's a beautiful plan. It's a wonderful design. There is happiness and freedom inside of that type of a relationship. And so what he's saying is this, as long as the husband is alive, the wife is bound to the law of marriage. The wife is bound to her husband. If the wife or the husband, you could flip this around, but for the sake of what verses two through four say, if the wife leaves the bonds of marriage and has a relationship with another man or marries another man and the husband is still alive, she is guilty of adultery because he's living. But if he were to die, if her spouse were to pass away and he were to die and she were to marry another, she's free to marry another because he's no longer alive. He's dead. She's been set free from that law of marriage and she's now free to go and marry somebody else. And so that's the illustration that Paul is using to draw this point home. Okay, so he's going somewhere with all of this. Here's the the point that he's trying to draw out. Okay, the setup. We are set free to serve. We are set free to serve. Look at verse 4 of chapter 7. All right, everybody, verse 4. He says this, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You know what he's saying there? In Christ, we're united with Christ, right? And when Christ died, we died. We didn't just die to our sinful flesh and to our old nature and to our old man. We actually died to the law as well. When he fulfilled the law and he died on the cross, we died to the law. We are set free. And we're not set free to go live however we want. We're set free to marry a new spouse. And that new spouse is the very one who rose again from the grave. It's Jesus Christ. And we're set free to walk in newness of life, to bring forth fruit that is pleasing unto God in the way that we live our lives. All right, so we are set free to serve. We're released from the law. We're set free to serve. He builds on this just a little bit more before he moves on. Look at verse 5. He says this, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, that just means our sinful passions, okay? So for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, our sinful passions, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. You know what he's saying here? The law was a terrible spouse. If you want to talk about, since we are in the illustration of marriage, We're going to just talk about it. And maybe just like slavery was not the the most perfect illustration you can use. It's one that will work. This is one that we can understand. The law was not a good spouse. The law was the biggest nag that you could ever possibly imagine being married to in your entire life. Because you know why? The law demands perfection. And every single time you mess up, you know what's standing over you? The law calling you out. You shouldn't have done that. You should have done this. You should have been paying attention here. That's not the way God wants you to live. You're messed up. You got some serious problems. That's what it was like being married to the law. God forbid, huh? Anybody want to? 
No one would want to be in a marriage like that. That's what he's saying in verse 5. The law was a terrible spouse. Our sinful passions were awakened. They were, they were constantly being pointed out. And all we can do is produce fruit unto death. But then he gets to verse 6 and he says this. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Oh, I'm reading chapter 6, verse 6. I keep going there every time. Verse 6 of chapter 7. My bad. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We were delivered from the law. Man, that, that spouse... That was a nag, that one that was just driving us constantly crazy with our imperfections. We died to that in Christ, and now we are free to marry another. We are free to marry Christ. We are free to live in a brand new way. And so here's what I want to say just about this. When we're talking about being set free to serve, get excited. Get excited. We get to serve in newness of spirit. We get to walk in newness of life. I have a very true story I'm about to tell you. I kid you not, I I am not making this up and I am not going to exaggerate the story at all. I had a man walk into my office about five or six years ago. Nobody that you all know in here, okay? So I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, so just to make you all comfortable with that. But this guy came walking into my office and at some point in our conversation, he starts talking about his wives. And he starts talking about his first wife that he had. Not, Not multiples, but his first wife. And he's like, one at a time, okay, I'm getting somewhere. <laughs> said wives, everybody's like, whoa, where is this going? <laughs> he's talking about his wife, his first wife. And he's like, you know, it's like I gotta tell you, Pastor Mike, he's like, you know, God gave me a wife and she was a good lady. And uh, we had children and we served the Lord together, you know, but I'm not saying it was always the greatest of times, but, I, you know, God was good. He's like, she passed away a few years ago, but I'll tell you what, God has given me a new wife. And I'll tell you what, as he's doing this, his eyes just light up. Everything about his countenance changed. And he's like, can I tell you, she is wonderful. Now, I'm not saying that my first wife wasn't that wonderful, but I'm telling you, this one is wonderful. She's amazing. We're happy. We're serving the Lord with joy. And he just is going down the road. And I'm just sitting there like, I can't believe that he's saying this out loud. I went home and told Elaine, I was like, if I die, you better never talk about me like that. I am the best spouse you will ever have, you know. I mean, we're just going down that road, and uh, I'm just sitting there thinking, this, this man, he didn't say it straight up, but his first marriage was just okay at best, but his second marriage was absolutely amazing. And the point is not to think about marriage and your spouses, okay, and how to get out of who you're married to or whether it's good or not. That's not the point. The point is the law. The law was not who we want to be married to, but Christ is. And we've been given a new lease on life, and we've been given new opportunities. We don't get to just walk in newness of life. We get to serve in newness of spirit. Just like what makes a marriage healthy and wonderful and vibrant is when both spouses humble themselves and submit themselves one to another and serve one another. The joy that comes, the life that comes as a result of it. That's what it's all about. And so that's the setup. We get to serve in newness of spirit. We don't have, only have a new master. We have a wonderful new relationship with Jesus Christ himself that changes everything. All right, so that's the setup. Let's talk about the inconceivable. Number two, the inconceivable. All right, look at verse 7 with me. Chapter 7, verse 7. He says, he asks a question here. What shall we say then? Everybody help me out. Read out loud the next four words with me. What's the question here? Is the law sin? Is the law sin? This is a pretty fair question. Paul knows that he's going to have some detractors throwing shade at all the things that he's been saying. Because all the way up to this point, he's just been talking about how bad the law was in the sense of it was a terrible master. It was a terrible spouse. We are set free from the law. And he's excited about that fact over and over again. So he asked to ask this question, is the law sin? And what's God's answer there in verse seven? What's the next two uh, words? Everybody out loud. God forbid, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Is the law sin? God forbid. He says no. The law is good. 
In fact, I would not have known the fact that I, I would not have known the fact that I have uh, lustful desires, and that's not necessarily sensual desires. It's just strong desires for things that I don't have, unless the law told me, "Thou shalt not covet." I love the fact that Paul only uses one commandment too, because you know what? It is not difficult to prove to us how sinful and wretched we really are. I don't think I have to take a lot of time to convince us all today that we are sinners, that we are broken. Sin nature, it's being played out in our nursery right now. I promise you, there is a two-year-old kid that's standing there with his toy. He's got it in his mouth. He's drooling and as happy as he can possibly be. That's your baby right there. He's living his best life. And there's some other kid that's looking at his toy and says, that looks really good with all that drool and stuff. He looks like he's having a good time. And he's about to go up and snatch that thing right out of his hand and take it. We don't just have covetousness going on in the nursery. We got straight up thievery going on in the nursery too. It's happening. That's who we are by nature. We're broken. And that's what Paul said. The, the law is good. It shows us how sinful we are because it was our sin and our brokenness that ultimately led us to cry out to God for a savior. And that's why we put our faith and trust in Jesus. So bottom line is, is the law saying, no, it's good. It shows us how sinful we are. Well, he asks another question in here too. Skip down with me to verse 13. Chapter 7, verse 13. He says at the beginning of this verse, he says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? All right, so basically, here's the question that he's asking. Is it the law's fault that I sin? All right, so because the law awakens these sinful passions, is it the law's fault that I did sin? Is it, is it the law that brought sin into my life? And is it the law's fault that I am condemned? And look at what he answers with in verse 13. Was it then that which is good made death unto me? Everybody, those next two words out loud. God forbid. It wasn't the law that, that made me sin and that condemns me. You know what it is? It's sin that makes me sin. <laughs> it's my human nature. Go back to verse 8 with me. He says this right here. But sin... Taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. That just means evil cravings. For without the law, sin was dead. And then he says in verse 9, For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. I like this. Paul's essentially saying, There was a point in time where I was living my best life. I didn't know the law. I was out there doing what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted, and I didn't know any better. And I was oblivious to it all. And life was great and grand and things were good. And man, life was awesome. But then all of a sudden, the commandment came. And what happened? Sin revived. <laughs> I love this part right here. Something inside of all of our human natures wants to rebel against sin. That's what he said. The law arouses our sinful nature. It, it actually draws it to the surface and it re doesn't just reveal, it shows us how sinful we really truly are. Here's a simple illustration. When you see a sign that says, do not touch, what do you want to do? Where's all the people that reach out and touch? If there's a rock that says do not climb or a fence that says don't come on the other side of it, you just automatically take that as a challenge and a dare that they're trying to keep me from something good that's on the other side. And so you climb on that rock or you go out to that spot that you're not supposed to because as soon as you see it, I mean, you were just living your best life. Everything was fine and great. And then it said don't touch. And that takes a challenge. It's daring me to touch. That's where we're at. But that's our sinful nature. We talked about that in chapter 6. Paul's actually not talking to that side of this. He's actually talking to the people that aren't rebels, to the ones that want to do what's right, to the person that absolutely cringes and fills up with all kinds of angst inside when they see somebody touch, when the sign says, do not touch. Where are all of you at? Where are all my rule followers no one wants to raise their We got no rule followers here? Not one? Okay, I got some. Yeah. Actually, the rule followers are being pointed out by all of the spouses in their lives. <laughs> That's what's happening right now. That's a beautiful sight right there. Man, there are just some people that just, 
if it's, if it's black, it's black. If it's white, it's white. I mean, if it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And don't step outside the boundaries of that. And guess what? That can work up all kinds of evil desires inside of us too. Because look what it says in verse 10. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Man, Paul was somebody who loved the law. The Pharisees and the Sadducees in the New Testament, they are people that loved the law. There are all kinds of religious and righteous people in our world today that love the law and absolutely love the law. But you know what the reality is this? The law cannot give life. The law cannot give life. The law produces death. That's what this chapter is teaching us. One of two things is going to happen. One is this. The harder you try to be righteous the more hopeless you're going to become. I was thinking about Martin Luther today. Martin Luther is uh, the man that started the Reformation back in the 1500s. He nailed the 95 theses to the wall. He was a, a monk, and he tried to live a life that was righteous enough and pleasing enough to God. He tried to earn his way, to produce his own righteousness, and he would go on these long fasts. He would even have himself beaten and scourged so that the evil would be driven out of him. And the harder he tried to be righteous and to rid himself of all the evil in this world, the more hopeless and desperate he became. That's what happens. You want to get up and try to live a life that pleases God and you do it in your own strength and in your own power, you're going to only become more hopeless because you're going to realize how difficult and impossible that is as a human being. So don't try to be righteous. Here's the other thing that could happen. The other side of the coin is this. You could actually start living by the law and start seeing some changes in your life. And the more righteous you become, actually, the more self-righteous you become. And the more self-righteous you become, the more legalistic you become. And what does that mean? You start expecting everybody to live by the same rules and the same standards that you live by. And when they're not, instead of a kind, gracious, loving, merciful spirit, you become condemning and critical and start looking down on other people and start getting mad at the world that's around you because they're not obeying and living up to the same standard. And you know who we especially take that out on? Our brothers and sisters in Christ, church people. And we can start becoming condemning and we can start looking down on others. Man, when you start seeing what's wrong with life and what's wrong with people more than you start seeing what's good in people, more than you start seeing through the eyes of grace and mercy, you got something way out of whack in your life. And even though the law has produced some good things and some good ways to live that have been healthy for you in one sense, they're completely unhealthy and they're completely harmful when you use them to become critical and condemning of others around you. God forbid. Legalism doesn't make you more spiritual. It makes you more sinful. The law cannot give life. Legalistic Christians and churches do not bear fruit. They cannot bear fruit because we're focused on our own self-righteousness more than we are on the grace and mercy of God. And what this chapter is teaching us is that the law stirs up sin inside of us. That's what it does. It brings out our evil cravings and our evil desires. There's a lot of ways I could go with this, but it is sad to say that there are so many people in America today that don't want to darken the doors of a church because of self-righteous, legalistic, critical, condemning spirits. People have been hurt by churches and Christians, and I'm not, I'm not trying to throw churches under the bus. I'm just trying to call out an attitude that should never prevail in our hearts and in our lives when it becomes more about what we're against than what it is that we're for. And when we start looking down on the world around us and when we become ungracious and unmerciful in our spirit, God forbid, that sends people far away and it creates hurt. And yes, Many people use that as a crutch to keep them from Jesus. Because they've been hurt before, they won't take the right steps to get over that and allow God to forgive them. But that still should never allow us as Christians in a church to become, to live that way or to have that type of a spirit inside of us. And so here's the, the practical application from all of this. Wise up. Wise up. Look at verse 12. 
Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. The law is good and wonderful. Nowhere has Paul ever taught in this that we can go live how we want. No, we walk in newness of life. We serve in newness of spirit. There is a way that God wants us to live. The law is good. But it says in the next verse, in verse 13, was, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. What he's saying is this. See how exceedingly sinful sin is. There's a tongue twister for you. Y'all want to say that out loud with me? I feel like everybody needs a lot of extra help staying awake today. That's what I feel like. There's a lot of holiday hangover, a lot of... uh, pies and stuffing and turkey I think that's still making us full and tired and that rain out there is not helping I know it okay but see how exceedingly sinful sin is it can use something like the law to produce such tragic results don't why when we're talking about wise up don't let the law make you hopeless and self-indulgent don't look at the Christian life and say God wants me to change and there's a certain way that he wants me to live I can't do it. It's impossible. And so you just go out and you just sin and you ask God to forgive you. That's a horrible way to live. That's not why you went to the cross. But don't do the opposite either. Don't let the law make you hopeless and self-righteous. Don't let the law make you condemning and critical of everybody else around you. See how exceedingly sinful the law is. Something good can be used so tragically to not lead us closer to Christ, but to lead us further away. It's inconceivable that we would allow ourselves to live that way way. And that brings us all back to where we started. There's that, that fine line, that balancing act. So let's talk about the believable. Look at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The law is not the problem. Who's the problem? I'm the problem. You're the problem. We all are the problem. The law is good, but I'm not. I'm a new creation in Christ but I still have my sin nature. I'm married to Christ, but my flesh doesn't want to be bound. Do you see this tug of war that's at play here? And here's the believable. Here's what we have to know about ourselves. I'm at war. I'm at war. Yeah, we talked about that we have a new master and and we're united with Christ. We died. Our old man is dead and our new man is raised to walk in newness of life. But I am at war because I have a new nature, but I still live inside of my sinful flesh. I don't think there's another paragraph in the Bible that strikes at my heart the same way that this one does right here. Man, this one, just as we go through this, feel the desperation that's here. Look at what he says in verse 15. He says, for that which I do, I allow not. That word allow means to grasp, okay? For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. What he's saying is this. I I don't understand why I do what I do. I don't get it. I don't understand it. The things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. And I, I I can't grasp why I act the way that I act. He says in verse 16, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. This is not a person that's rebellious in his heart. This is somebody that when you sin and you mess up, you know that you sinned and you know that you mess up and you confess it. And you're like, God, I know I did wrong. I don't want to do wrong. You're right. I wish I could change my life. I wish that everything could be different about my life. I I agree with the law. Look what he says in verses 17. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. You know what he's saying here? First of all, verse 17, we're going to come back to that at the end of the message. He says, it is no longer I that do it. You know why? You are dead to the old man, and you are alive unto Christ. God doesn't see our sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But that does not negate the fact that I still have a sinful flesh. And then he gets to verse 18, and he's like, he just pours out his heart here. He's like, I want to do what's right, but I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to live right. 
I, I want to consent unto the law. I want to be obedient to the law. And I want to do right in my life. But yet I keep doing wrong. And I want that to change. But how can it change? How can I get help? How can I get released from that? Do you feel the desperation that is breathing through the course of his veins in this? Does anybody else ever feel that in your life? I mean, do you wake up and you want to be the man that God wants you to be or the woman that God wants you to be and you want to be obedient, but yet you continually fail and you mess up and you fall? When I told you there's not another paragraph in the Bible that resonates with me like this, that's where I live. And it's tiring. It gets frustrating. I I feel like Paul feels here. You know what he does in verses 19 through 23? He repeats himself. Let's just read it. Let's all read it out loud together. Put verse 19 up on the screen. Everybody help me out here. Verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. We are at war every single day of our lives. I want to do good, but all of a sudden there's this evil that's pulling me and holding me back. I want to stay away from evil, but it's hard to do good and it's hard to do right. And I love what he says in verse 24. He just concludes it with, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You want to know what's believable this Christmas season? We're at war. You're at war and make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ can be on full display throughout this season because this truly is a holiday that is all about Christ. It's about his birth. It's about his, uh, the reason why he came, which was to go to a cross. There are gonna be so many opportunities for joy and hope and peace to be evident and seen in your life. But every day you get up, Satan's gonna attack you with busyness, with pressure, with, uh, with brokenness, brokenness, your own sinful nature, your children's sinful nature, your spouse's sinful nature. He's going to attack us with this world. He's going to do everything he can to rob us of that joy. And we can find ourselves sitting all alone like that elephant at the beginning of the story, just sitting there, just wishing that we had some help and that we had some deliverance. Do you understand? We're at war. We have a new nature, but we still have a sin nature. A wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this death? (laughs) You ready for something good? The doable. Here's the last point. The doable. Everybody look at verse 24 with me. Well, actually, verse 25. I just said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And everybody read that very first phrase out loud like you mean it. All right, here we go. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's hope. There's an answer. His name is Jesus I love how this uh, Romans started. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And that's just not at the moment that we believe, but that is salvation until the day that we die. There is deliverance. There is hope. There is freedom. There is power available to us every single day because our God and our Savior is alive and he wants to fill us with his spirit and energize us to live in a way that is pleasing to him. Look back at verse 17. I want to show you this one more time. Thou, now then, it is no more I that do it. I love that verse. How, how is it not I that does it? How, that sounds like a cop-out, actually, to me. It's like, it's like a, when you point at someone else and say, he made me do it. In a real sense, that's, that's exactly what he's saying here. Like, we are declared righteous. We are new creations in Christ. Sometimes we have to go to God and we have to say, he made me do it. My sin nature made me do it. My new man didn't want to do it, but my sin nature made me do it. You understand, the way that God sees you and the way that God sees me is not the way that your children might see you or your spouse might see you or your family members might see you. They don't remember. your. He doesn't see your mistakes and your flaws and your faults and your failures. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
He sees it. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. Everything about your life has changed. So the question still remains, though, but, but what do I do? I mean, that's awesome and that's good, but I still have this sinful nature. So what do I do? How do I live? I, is there anybody else that's tired of going back and forth like I am? You want some hope? You want a way to go forward? Well, look at verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Everybody just underline this next phrase, and you can circle the word mind. But so then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. So then, with the mind, we are all the way back to where we started three weeks ago. We started with the fact that your mindset can change everything. We talked about that placebo drug, you know, the, the fake treatment. But people believe that the, they believe in the treatment, and so their mind actually is what starts healing it. It's the belief in the treatment that starts healing them. That's how the Christian life works. It's not, the gospel's not fake, by the way. The gospel is absolutely 100% real. And when we believe in the treatment, when we believe in the power of God and what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, and we start seeing ourselves the way that God sees us, everything about our life changes. This is awesome because I'm not giving you a to-do list today. I'm not going out of here and saying, okay, if you're tired of that back and forth between life, here's three things that you need to do. Take them every day, get up and do it, and you will be a new, completely new person. No, that's not what he's saying. So then with the mind, so then with the mind, I serve the law of God. Here's the culmination of these two chapters. Become what you are. See yourself the way that God sees you. How many of you are parents in here? Parents will understand this. How many of you see your kids in the best absolute light that you can possibly see them? And sometimes you feel like your children don't see yourself the way that they really truly are, the way that you see them. And you wish with all of your hearts that they would just open their eyes and they would see the potential and the power that's there. That's how God's looking at us. I don't see your past I don't see your sin. I don't see your faults and failures. I see the righteousness of Jesus. And I gave you the Holy Spirit to change you and to transform you. How many of you have a besetting sin in your life? The answer is you don't have to raise your hand. It's everybody. Here's what I want you to do for just a second. Think, think about that. What, what's your besetting sin? What's the thing in your life that you hate the most about you? When you start going down this chapter, you start thinking, man, this is the thing that gets me every single time. I've confessed this before. I've told you this many times. For me, it's impatience. I am an impatient person. Man, whenever I start getting in a hurry, whenever I'm trying to finish up one job and there's another job or something that has to happen and, and the kids start needing something or people start asking me questions, I can just snap just like that. And I hate it. It's not good. I can just start ranting and raving and then 30 minutes later when everything's calm, I'm like, I'm really sorry, everybody. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to live that way. And I can really beat myself up sometimes. I can get up and I can say, God, I messed up again. How are my kids ever going to see you in my life if I'm not transforming and changing in this area? And I can start beating myself up. But you know how I get victory? I see myself the way that Christ sees me. No, in Jesus, you know what I am? I'm patient and I'm kind and I have self-control because I have somebody that's enabling me and helping me. And if I see myself that way, then I'll act on it and I'll believe it and I'll take the steps with God's help and God's strength to rely on him. Is it anger? Are you an angry person? See yourself the way that God sees you. You are meek. In Jesus Christ, you are meek. All of that power and all of that strength that can be used in an out-of-control way can be brought under control. You don't have to see yourself as an angry man and as an angry person. You don't have to live in that every day. You can be set free because in Jesus, you have been set free. And you are loving. And you are strong. And you are able. Hey, is it, is it addiction? In Christ, you are set free. You may feel like you're still chained and you're bound 
by those addictions and by those pressures that are beating you up every day. But no, when you believed in Jesus, those bands were loosed. You can look at Satan in the face and you say, you have no more power over me. You're not stronger than I am. You're not greater than I am. My God is greater and he set me free. And in his eyes, you are clean and you are valuable and you are loved. Is it sexual sin? Man, I think about this. I know there are so many people that beat themselves up. And these ones you keep hidden. You don't want anyone to find out about it. And every time you think about yourself, you feel dirty and you feel like a fraud. In Christ, you know what you are? You are pure and you are clean and you are the spotless bride that he came and he gave his life for. He died on the cross so that you could be married to him, so that you could have a relationship with him, so that you could love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's who you are in Christ. He loved you. He pursued you. He's never going to stop loving you. He's never going to stop pursuing you. He's never going to stop forgiving you. That's who you are in Jesus. It doesn't matter what your besetting sin is. It doesn't matter who you think you are that's not how Christ sees you and with our minds we fix them on who he is and we look at Satan and we say I'm not living that way anymore I'm going to be everything that God died on the cross for me to be that's what's doable that's what's believable that's that's the gift that will keep on giving every single day of your life until the day you die That balancing act, it's not about what you do and you don't do. It's about what you think you are. It's about who you know you are. And then as a result of that, you stand in that freedom. And you look to Jesus and you say, God, I don't deserve that kind of mercy. I don't deserve that kind of grace. But I don't want to blow this opportunity to be everything that you created me to be, everything that you died for me to be. I'm going to live how you want me to. Wow. Things will begin to change. You'll run to God's word for hope. You won't feel like you have to. Everything about your life will be different.